from uh, the Paris University. Thank you very much, <coughs> Ali, and uh, good morning uh, for this presentation. I disclose uh, my conflicts of interest with Pulchin Medical Systems and with Göttinger, and with Baxter, I'm sorry. Hemodynamic monitoring, uh, a few years ago, the only monitoring devices were for heart rate, platysmography, blood pressure, and we had the old invasive pulmonary artery catheter. But hemodynamic monitoring is a field where technological progress has already led to the development of many new devices providing more variable, sometimes less non-invasive devices. But what is the future? Of course, it's always risky, and I will not uh, play a clairvoyant, but um, I think a good way to answer the question may be to ask if we think about, if we think of the future, what would be the best monitoring device we would like? I dream of a device that would be non-invasive, perhaps accurate for sure, comprehensive, that would allow a comprehensive analysis of the patient's uh, condition, easy to use and intelligent. Non-invasiveness is already a mantra for hemodynamic monitoring, as you know, and many of the new monitoring devices that have been developed are already non-invasive. And today, launching an invasive cardiac output monitoring device would be as building a car that consumes uh, uh, 20 liters per 100 kilometers. So, non-invasiveness is a goal and likely we will go on this path. We already have some non-invasive devices, bioreactants for cardiac output, volume clamp methods for cardiac output or arterial pressure. But this could be even more miniaturized devices. A few years ago, uh, Michard and Sassler have reviewed already these, uh, these uh, patches that can be pasted on the skin and that measures some quite standard variables, heart rate, respiratory rate, arterial pressure, just with patches. It could be even cardiac output. We have now a new device which measures not cardiac output, but carotid blood flow. You see, just pasted in front of the carotid artery. It measures the carotid flow. It may be useful to test response to tests of fluid responsiveness, for instance, so a non-invasive estimation of cardiac output. It is possible that the most invasive devices will be replaced by miniaturized devices. For instance, this is a device, a very small device, that can be inserted in the pulmonary artery to measure the pulmonary artery pressure, and this is a remote monitoring for outpatients in cardiology. I'm not sure it will come in the ICU, but in cardiology you can find many studies showing that this continuous monitoring of pulmonary artery pressure leads to a lower rate of readmissions in these patients with chronic heart failure, miniaturized devices. Blood pressure is, of course, the most interesting variable we have. And again, today we have some non-invasive ways, means to um, monitor cardiac uh, arterial pressure. But in the future, we may have even smaller devices. Thanks to new materials and flexible electronics, we have such devices. They are far from the market at the moment. But that you see pasted in front of an artery with measuring the piezoelectric waves, measure the arterial wave in a waveform in a quite reliable way. They even detect the diacritic notch, which opens the possibility for monitoring cardiac output from pulse counter analysis. We can even estimate some more complex variables than arterial pressure. And this may be particularly possible by using very basic variables analyzed by artificial intelligence. In hemodynamic uh, monitoring, AI may help us improve the measurements, for instance, in ultrasound. I will not speak about that. 
but also assess some variables that usually require an invasive device. Look, in this study, for instance, the authors analyzed the response of just platysmography to a Valsalva maneuver. And through a machine learning algorithm, they estimated the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure measured by the PA catheter. Another study showed that it's possible, again, through AI analysis of very basic variables to estimate central hypovolemia. I don't enter into details, but it was here just by analyzing electrocardiograms. So possible to, in, to estimate in a non-invasive way many variables. Nevertheless, these devices need to be accurate. And for the moment, and it's likely a very important point, the less invasive the devices are, the less accurate they are. Invasiveness is the only way to have an accurate measurement. If we think about the finger cuff method for measuring arterial pressure, so that is today on the market, the reliability is quite poor. We viewed here in this meta-analysis of Antonio Messina, in the large majority of the study, the accuracy for measuring cardiac output was not acceptable. So you see that the challenge in the future for these new devices will be to be not only non-invasive, but also accurate. Hemodynamic resuscitation is based basically for improving not cardiac output, blood pressure, but tissue perfusion. And today we assess uh, tissue oxygenation, anaerobic metabolism with the same variables for years. We may assess tissue oxygenation, for instance. This is a, a Foley catheter, you see, that measures urethral perfusion. Not sure it's very interesting, but in some studies, like this one by the team of uh, Alexandre Houston, they used it to estimate the effect of a goal-directed fluid therapy. Perhaps more interesting, we today have some devices, measure, a device at least, measuring the mitochondrial resp respiration. I don't tell you how it, how it does exactly, but you see that under such patches, it's able to measure the mitochondrial activity that decreases during a brachial cuff inflation that is properly inhibited by cyanide uh, application. It's not on the market for the moment, but perhaps we may have such devices investigating tissue oxygenation in a deeper in a more, um, um, uh, in a more um, comprehensive way. Microcirculation is definitely, you all know, an important pathophysiological variable, especially in sepsis. But the big problem, as we acknowledge in this consensus conference, uh, it was uh, a few years ago, is cambosome. It takes hours to analyze images and has many artifacts. And we already said that where we should go should be to an automated measurement. But this is now possible. There is a device that is, by the way, presented on a booth at this Congress, developed by Jan uh, that allows this automated measurement of microcirculation. It should be launched on the market next year. And you see that um, it may open the possibility to monitor microcirculation eventually at the bedside. Of course, we need easy-to-use devices, and one of the progresses that may come very soon is wireless devices that will allow uh, uh, us to avoid this, uh, some call it, sometimes it's called the spaghetti syndrome, you know, with the tubes, wires, etc. But perhaps more, it's not only aesthetic, uh, an aesthetic issue, it's these devices may allow the remote monitoring of patients out of the ICU, in the wards, after the ICU, after the operating room. And a proper comprehensive analysis of all the variables may allow an early detection of deterioration of these patients. In hospital, cardiac arrest is really an issue. This is, these are already old data from the UK. You see the rate of in-hospital cardiac arrests that often occur in the ward. And you see that they're usually due to the deterioration of very basic variables, hypoxia, arrhythmias. And so one of the 
possibilities offered by AI is to predict deterioration of the patients. This is predictive analytics. And likely you know that we already have some algorithms using very basic variables that predict clinical deterioration of patients in the wards. In the wards, by the way, there are breaks to using these devices in, in the clinical practice. There are many false alarms and there is a big issue with the responsibility. One nurse for 30 patients in the ward who monitors the patients and who responses, who responses to an alarm. In the operating room there are also some algorithms. One of the most developed one is this one. Perhaps you have seen this uh, article in the JAMA using the algorithm developed by Edwards led to less hypertension because the anesthesiologist had more reaction when the hypertension was predicted and detected by the system. And there is a large European study led by Bernd Saugel that, is, uh, that will show the clinical interest of such a monitoring. We have less um, algorithms in the ICU, but for instance, um, this one is interesting because the the authors showed that this hemodynamic stability index predicted deterioration and the more variables they put inside, the better was the prediction. Of course, what one expects mainly from AI is to help for making decisions. And likely the dream uh, comes from the insulin syringes, insulin pumps that automatically adapt the dose of insulin based on AI algorithms to the glucose level. And you know that these smart pumps that are today on the market allow a much tighter control of the glucose level. And it's true that, in fact, these monitoring devices provide many variables that must be integrated and that need sort of an expertise, especially if we take into account all the variables. It's much more complicated than just glucose level. And even the experts can make bad decisions or improve their, um, their decision process, especially for guiding fluid therapy or giving norepinephrine in a better way. Again, we don't have to wait because uh, there are some algorithms adapting the dose of norepinephrine to mean arterial pressure in an automated way. This is a closed loop system that has been investigated here again by the team of Alexandre Houston, they, they showed that it reduces intra-operative hypertension. And I show this study, which is very recently, uh, which has been uh, uh, published uh, a few um, uh, weeks ago in the ICU after cardiac surgery. It was conducted here in, in the RASM hospital in Brussels. And you see that patients spent less time in hypertension thanks to this closed loop system. For fluids, it's a bit more complicated because you need to measure cardiac output, likely. We are working on this. But likely what we would expect at best from AI is to guide the whole treatment of shock patients from diagnosis to complex treatments. It's not, we are not, we did not reach the goal for the moment and uh, as for respiratory systems, it's far from the use uh, of such devices. But likely you've read this article in Nature Medicine by Komarovsky and authors. It's a complex article, of course, but they have developed an artificial intelligence clinician that learned from many um, data coming from many patients from a large database. And they showed that if patients would have been treated by this AI clinician, they would have received less fluid and more vasopressors. So you see an initial step in developing something that may help treating these patients. And what's interesting is that they show that if clinicians had taken decision close to the decisions of the AI clinician, the survival was better, suggesting that this AI clinician is good for prognosis. And there are new studies published with this uh, device or algorithm, I don't know. And it's interesting, the conclusion, they said that in the last 15 years, 
Many treatments have been developed without reducing mortality in sepsis, and so the use of computer decision support systems should better guide treatments and may improve outcome. This is a, a, a message full of hope. So to conclude, likely we will have some non-invasive devices or minimally invasive devices that will provide many variables, including complex variables. The challenge is that to keep accuracy, it will allow perhaps a more comprehensive analysis, especially of tissue oxygenation. Devices would be easier to use, wireless, and this will allow remote monitoring. And finally, perhaps that we will use all these devices in a smarter way to guide the treatment of our patients, but perhaps that things will be completely different. Thank you for your attention.